of Training and Technical Assistance Team is honored to welcome you to this California Housing and Community Development Workshop offered through the Emergency Solutions Grant, Coronavirus Relief, consulting and staffing services contract. I am Kimberly from ICF and I will be hosting today's session. Today's training session is part of our new and non-traditional providers workshop series where we are discussing ESG and ESG CV evaluating client eligibility. It is my pleasure to hand the presentation over to our first presenter, Gordon. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Gordon Levine. My pronouns are he and him, and I am white and Jewish. I am a lead homeless services specialist with ICF, and I am excited to be with y'all today. If you could please take a moment to drop in the chat and let us know your name, pronouns, organization, and which county you're from. We always like to know who we are presenting to. Um, we know that this is not the most thrilling topic on the entire planet, um, but we're excited you joined us as it's critically important, uh, and the information we have to present today um, will be uh, valuable to you regardless of what kinds of projects you are running. So thanks for joining us. Um, I would like at this time to invite my co-presenter Erin to introduce herself. Thank you, Gordon. My name is Erin Rutherford. My pronouns are she, her. I am an ESG CV grant administrator uh, for ICF on behalf of HCD. Happy to be here. All right, thanks very much, Aaron. Uh, let's go ahead and dive in. So our training agenda today, um, we know that this meeting is scheduled, I think on some of your calendars, at least for two hours. I don't believe that we're going to be taking two hours. Um, I will be surprised if we clip an hour and a half, though you have us for the whole time if you need us. Um, today, we're going to be talking about client eligibility uh, and how to assess and document that. Um, we're going to talk first about HUD's definitions and then about uh, how to evaluate those eligibility requirements. Uh, at the end, of course, we're going to have a lightning round um, using the Slido platform, which some of you may not have seen before. Uh, it's like Menti or any of those other uh, sort of audience Q&A things. You'll dig it. It's fun. Um, and then we'll have an opportunity for Q&A at the end. Uh, so you can let us, uh, let us know uh, in the chat as we go through. If you have any questions, you can hold them to the end. You can drop them uh, in the chat. You can message them anonymously. We're happy to take them in whatever way you'd like to put them out. Next slide, please. All right, over to you, Erin. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, so if you have been attending these trainings before, I think this is a graphic that you're probably familiar with. Um, but if not, as a reminder, HUD provides ESG funds to California HCD, who is the recipient. And then California HCD, in turn, awards those funds to be carried out via their sub-recipients, which is typically the local government or a nonprofit agency. And some sub-sub-recipients, or sorry, excuse me, and some sub-recipients, in turn, contract out their direct services to their own sub-sub-recipients. And so today's training is geared towards the sub-recipient and sub-sub-recipients that are receiving ESG or ESG CV funds. Next slide, Kim. Thank you. And similarly, again, if you've attended any of our trainings in the past, you're probably familiar with these terms, but to those that are joining us today that might be new to the ESG program, here are some of the common terms that we are going to use today. So <clears throat> ESG is the Emergency Solutions Grant Program. ESG CV is the Emergency Solutions Grant Funding that is provided through the CARES Act. COC is the Continuum of Care. Fiscal year is the year in which ESG funds are allocated by HUD, which we are currently in fiscal year 2023. And California HCD is the California Department of Housing and Community Development, which is the largest ESG recipient in the state of California. We also have HUD, which is the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is the entity that funds ESG. We have recipient, which is an entity that receives ESG directly from HUD, such as California HCD. The subrecipient, as I mentioned, is a local government entity or a nonprofit that gets ESG funding from the recipient. Sometimes these are referred to as grantees. And then lastly, we have what's probably my least favorite acronym, UGLUG, a unit of general local government. Next slide. Thank you again. 
So this slide gives us um, a graphic showing how regulations and policies interact with each other. In the center of all of this, we have compliance with ESG regulations, and compliance is in turn a combination of interlocking regulations, statutes, and policies that can happen at the federal, state, and local level. And now we're going to have Gordon talk us through the HUD definitions of homelessness. It's my very favorite subject. And I have to say, UGLUG is my favorite acronym. So I think this is probably a good presenting team. Um, sorry, go ahead, Erin. Oh, no, I said we'll agree to disagree. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, in, indeed. Well, uh, uh, I think uh, at the end of the day, it's it's just such an ugly acronym that I can't help but love it. It's got a gremlin thing going. Um, so HUD definitions, let's go ahead to the next slide. So uh, the HUD definitions are really the Hearth Act definitions. Um, HUD's definitions of homelessness are contained in the Hearth Act, which is the Homeless Emergency Assistance and Rapid Transition to Housing Act um, in the Defining Homelessness Final Rule, um, which is, uh, it, a, a, this is a piece of trivia, um, but it is uh, regulatory rather than, it, it's statutory rather than regulatory, so it exists at the level of congressional approval, not at the level of HUD approval, um, which you will probably not care about very much for the purposes of this presentation, but which matters a lot when you're talking about things like updating the VAWA definition of fleeing domestic violence, which I think will be uh, something you bump into over the next year. Um, in this presentation, uh, any references to the final rule uh, are referring to the defining homelessness final rule, uh, unless we say otherwise. There is no COC program or ESG program final rule yet. Uh, there will be at some point. At some point really does mean at some point. Um, but when we talk about the final rule, we're talking about the defining homelessness final rule. Um, these definitions are included in the ESG program interim rule at 24 CFR 576, um, but fundamentally, uh, the important point here is that the ESG program interim rule doesn't define these things. It inherits its definition from somewhere else in the federal register. Uh, and you've got the, uh, the uh, you, you have the receipts for that up on the screen in front of you in case you like really deeply want to get into the federal register. Next slide, please. Uh, Aaron, helpfully dropping the bookmark to, to the uh, ESG program interim rule in the chat. Uh, I also have it bookmarked uh, and visited often. Um, so the HUD definition or the, uh, the HUD definition of homelessness, which is really the HEARTH definition of homelessness, we use those terms interchangeably, uh, has four categories in, in it. Uh, category one, literal homelessness. Category two, imminent risk of homelessness. Category three, Home, experiencing homelessness under other federal statutes in category four, which is fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence. We're going to define all of those today. Um, we're going to quiz you later about them. Um, well, I think what I would say as part of this introduction is um, in addition to these four, you're going to hear a fifth definition as you work with ESG, the at-risk definition, which is not a hearth definition, it is an ESG-specific definition of eligibility that applies only to category two, uh, which is, uh, or only to homelessness prevention projects. I apologize. We will discuss that more later, but I wanted to highlight that there is this fifth thing not on this chart that we're going to be talking about today. Next slide, please. So category one, which is literal homelessness, uh, is a household uh, that lacks a fixed regular nighttime residence, meaning that they have, meaning one of the following things is true. Could be more than one in theory, but it's at least one of the following things. Either A, they have a primary nighttime residence that is a public or private place not meant for human habitation, such as living in your car, living on the streets, living in a park, living in a tent, uh, living in an abandoned building. Um, there are further edge cases that are kind of question marky um, about like you're living in a building that was intended for human habitation, but the utilities are off. And so is it meant for human habitation? Um, that's a little out of scope of what we're talking about here today. We can cover it in Q&A if it's important to y'all. Um, but just to note that it's not quite as clear cut as it might necessarily appear, and you will run into those edge case scenarios from time to time. So that's A. Or B, they're living in a publicly or privately operated shelter designed to provide temporary living arrangements, which includes 
congregate shelters, non-congregate shelters, which is hotels or motels paid for by charitable organizations or government programs, or transitional housing. Um, the, the thing that often trips people up here uh, is uh, folks see hotel motel and think, great, if a person's in a hotel or motel, they, they, they meet the category one definition. And the answer is, is no, usually that's not the case. Um, the, uh, the definition is that you're living in a hotel or motel and the stay is being paid for by a charitable organization or a government program. ESG is a government program. If they're living in a hotel motel paid for by ESG CV or ESG, they're golden, they're absolutely qualifying. But unfortunately, in my opinion, um, if they're living in a hotel or motel and they're paying for it out of their own pocket or out of uh, what a cousin of mine used to call uh, the bank of mom and dad, or if they're paying for it with you know, even the charity of their friends and support networks, well, that very much seems like a person who ought to uh, qualify under category one. Unfortunately, it, it does not. Finally, C, there's this uh, last criterion that does not come up very often, but is important. Um, the household is exiting an institution where they resided for 90 days or fewer, and before they entered, entered that institution, they lived in one of the other places in this category. So they were in a place not meant for human habitation or transitional housing or a charitably paid for hotel motel. Then they went into an institution and they've been there for 90 days or fewer. If all of those things are true, they meet the category one definition and they can go directly from that institution into uh, a project that requires category one uh, eligibility, um, such as rapid rehousing. One note about institution is that that's a little bit broader than folks often think it is. Um, the the low hanging fruit, people see institution and they read jail, right? We're talking about prison or jail, but it's actually a little broader than that. Um, and so the big five in terms of uh, institutions that are sort of most commonly looked at um, under this category are jail, prison, a physical health institution, uh, which is a hospital usually, um, but it could be a rehabilitative center, uh, a, or a behavioral health institution, um, which could include, uh, for example, a psychiatric ward, uh, but it could also include a substance abuse treatment facility. Um, and finally, a foster care facility would qualify as an institution, a foster care facility or any other facility uh, that is designed to provide for the housing of a person under the age of 18. Um, that one is uh, not often, that's infrequent, um, but it's important. It's unusual that you would get someone passing through that facility for fewer than 90 days. Um, and uh, there may be state or local regulations that prohibit providing housing to people of certain ages uh, through ESG um, that require them to receive housing through uh, a foster care or similar system. Um, but just be aware that that is an institution that can qualify, assuming there aren't other legal restrictions on doing so. Next slide, please. All right, category two, by contrast, uh, is going to seem murkier and simpler. Um, category two is a household that will imminently lose its primary nighttime residence, provided that, A, that residence will be lost within 14 days of the date of their application for homelessness assistance, and B, no subsequent residence has been identified, so they don't have anywhere else to go, and C, they lack the resources or support networks needed to obtain other permanent housing. So for example, you might be losing your housing within 14 days and you might not know where you're going next, but if you just won the lottery, you don't qualify because you've got plenty of money to get other housing. Um, you need to not have the capacity to identify subsequent permanent housing. So the big misunderstanding, the, the big challenge really with category two um, is while category one is pretty prescriptive, um, even if there's some wibbliness around like, well, what if I'm in a like a unit where the utilities have been turned off? Like generally it's pretty prescriptive. If you're living it, if you're if you're sleeping in the rough, right? Like if you're sleeping in your car, you're sleeping outside, if you're in an emergency shelter already, um, if you're in a transitional housing situation, you meet the category one definition. And it's pretty cut and dry. Category two is not cut and dry 
because you need to establish that residents will be lost within 14 days of the date of application for homelessness assistance. The number one mistake people make when looking at this category two definition is they see category two and they see how residents will be lost within 14 days and they say, oh, cool. So if I've got an eviction notice, that's a five day notice, five days is less than 14 days, that's category two. Absolutely 100% wrong. A five day notice to pay or quit will never be sufficient to qualify for category two because a five day notice to pay or quit is not notice that you will lose your housing within 14 days. It's notice that you have five days to fix a situation that could eventually lead to you losing your housing. Moreover, a five day notice to pay or quit is very unlikely to turn into losing housing within losing that residence within 14 days, right? It's just a reality of our legal system that like, if you turn up with a five day notice, it it's not gonna be on day six, you're in court and on day seven, the sheriff is there kicking you out. That's not the way that that works. Um, things simply move more slowly than that. And because they move more slowly than that, there are many opportunities to stop the eviction process or to stop the housing loss process. Finally, just because people uh, just because a household is evicted from their current housing doesn't mean they're going to lose their lose housing. It doesn't mean that they'll experience literal homelessness. homelessness. One of my big eye-opening moments in homeless services was when, I don't remember who told me this at this point, it's been a long time. It might have been Ian DeYoung of all people, um, but uh, the, it, I, I got it flipped on my head uh, where the, the presentation was like, all right, everybody is kind of walking around with this implicit assumption because we see it and we're, we're homeless services providers and you hear it on the news and it's this big political punching bag. Why is there so much homelessness everywhere? And it's a bad question. The question isn't why aren't so many people experiencing homelessness? It's actually why are so very few people experiencing homelessness? Despite it being visible and very disruptive to certain people or to certain locations, homelessness is exceedingly rare in this country. So the question is, why do people experience homelessness? And that's really what this uh, residence will be lost and there's no alternatives available is trying to get at. Who are the folks who will imminently lose their residence within 14 days and they don't have anywhere else to go and if you don't step in with assistance, they will definitely experience homelessness. That's what this is trying to get at. And an eviction notice doesn't usually lead to homelessness overwhelmingly. And eviction overwhelmingly does not lead to homelessness. So uh, the key for establishing category two eligibility is to have strong documentation in the client file explaining why in this participant situation, they're gonna lose their housing within 14 days. And an eviction could be part of it, but it often is only a part of it if it's a part of it at all. Um, and eviction might not even be like the, the whole thing of it or a formal eviction. Yeah, uh, you know, losing housing due to family disunification, right? You know, I'm, I'm 18 and I came out to my parents and I'm being kicked out of my, I'm, I'm losing my housing because I'm 18 and my parents uh, don't know how to deal with my gender identity is unfortunately very common uh, and, and is, a, is a common cause of youth homelessness uh, and young adult homelessness. Um, so situations like that really run the gamut. Um, and so category two is, has a much broader uh, and a much less well-defined uh, set of how it's documented. Next slide, please. Category three. The best part about this slide is that you can ignore it. I'm gonna tell you why, but then you can forget all about it. Category three is homelessness under other federal statutes, which includes unaccompanied youth under 25 years of age, families with children and youth who don't otherwise qualify as homeless under this definition, but who are defined as homeless under other statutes listed in the hard fund rule, um, haven't had a lease or home ownership interest uh, during the prior 60 days before the homeless assistance application, 
They've experienced persistent instability as measured by two or more moves in the preceding 60 days, and they can be expected to continue in that status for an extended period of time due to special needs or barriers. Here's why you don't have to care. I think there's actually a slide about this later. Um, we'll hold that for them, but for what you need to know is uh, fundamentally you can't serve. Your uh, COC program projects in California are not approved to serve category three, and no ESG projects are approved to serve category three. So we'll talk about it more later, but don't worry too much about category three. You won't hear about it again. Next slide, please. Ah, there's the next slide. Um, category three restrictions. Um, there have to be, there, there are special conditions you have to meet in order to serve households that meet the category three definitions. No ESG projects under HCD's ESG program, including both ESG and ESGCB are approved to serve category three households. So you can forget all about category three. You're not allowed to serve people in category three. We can sometime over coffee talk about why it's long and complicated, but the really short version is category three is complicated and different in, in, in order of magnitude more complicated to get into serving even than category two. And frankly, category two is pretty difficult to get into. Um, so while we're getting folks uh, acclimated, it makes a lot of sense to me that category three is just, it's it's not in, not in reach right now. Next slide, please. And finally, category four, which is people who are fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, which is any person, uh, individual or family, so it can be a family unit, who is, who meets all of the following criteria. A, they are fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, or other dangerous or life-threatening conditions that relate to violence against the individual or a family member that either takes place in or makes them afraid to return to their primary nighttime residence, which includes human trafficking, which itself includes sex trafficking and labor trafficking. And B, they have no other identified residents. And C, they lack the resources and support networks to obtain other permanent housing. Only thing that I will say about this is that uh, the only ESG project that, uh, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, the thing that I will say about this that folks often get wrong is that category four is not in itself alone enough to qualify for eligibility in rapid rehousing. Under rapid rehousing, you have to hit category one. And if you were fleeing domestic violence, you should also qualify under category four because it qualifies you for certain law work protections, uh, such as emergency transfer plan access. Next slide, please. All right, back over to you, Erin, to talk about the fifth definition. Thank you, Gordon, for walking us through those four categories of the HUD homeless definition. Um, so as Gordon mentioned earlier, there is a uh, other little definition that we will cover um, that's just for ESG. Um, so in addition to the four definitions of homelessness, HUD also has a separate definition for at risk of homelessness. Um, I'm going to dive into those details on the next slide. Um, but just note that the at-risk definition can only be used for homelessness prevention projects. Anyone who meets the at-risk definition is not eligible for street outreach, emergency shelter, or rapid rehousing projects. So if you're going to remember anything from this slide, just remember at-risk definition applies to HP, homelessness prevention. Next slide, Kim. Thank you. Okay, so here we have the detailed definition for at risk of homelessness for individuals and families. Remember again, this definition applies only to clients eligible for homelessness prevention projects. So first, in order to meet the at risk of homeless definition, the participant must have an annual income below 30% of the area median income, and they must not have sufficient resources or support networks to avoid becoming literally homeless. And Gordon kind of provided examples of, you know, what that would look like. You have no friends, family, church, you know, alternative options to um, support you. If the participant meets these first two criteria, they also have to meet at least one of the following conditions on this list. So that would include that the participant has moved for economic reasons two or more times in the previous 60 days. That could be 
staying at someone's house, you know, not able to give them any money to be staying there, um, and you're kind of jumping from place to place. Um, they could be living in the home of someone else because of economic hardship. So just another example, you lose your job, you move in with a friend, you're staying on their couch um, because you've had that hardship. It could also be that the person has been notified that their right to occupy their current housing will be terminated within 21 days. And going back to what Gordon had mentioned about the difference between an actual eviction or termination notice versus a pay or quit. Um, so this is talking about that their right to occupy their housing is going to be ending within 21 days. Also could be that they live in a hotel or motel and the cost is not paid for by a charitable uh, or government assistance program. They also could be living in an SRO or efficiency unit where they're in which there resides more than two people or lives in a larger housing unit in which there resides more than one and a half people per room. So if you are living in overcrowded housing where there are you know, more people than double the number of rooms um, or if they're in that single room occupancy unit. They could also be exiting a publicly funded institution or system of care. And lastly, they could also otherwise live in housing that has characteristics associated with instability and an increased risk of homelessness, um, as identified in HCD as the ESG recipients uh, con plan. And we'll get into that in a minute. Um, and just lastly, as a reminder, California HCD has a homelessness prevention manual available on their website. And that manual outlines eligibility criteria for participants that are served in homelessness prevention projects, which includes participants falling under this at-risk category. Next slide, Kim. Thank you. So if you go online in those ESG regulations I posted in the chat to look up the at-risk of homeless definition, you may notice that there are a couple additional categories of eligibility under the at-risk definition, um, in addition to the individuals and families that we just covered on the previous slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because um, this at-risk definition um, for families and children with youth and for unaccompanied children and youth is not eligible under California HCD's uh, homelessness prevention projects. Um, so we're just going to kind of skip through this one um, because you do not have to worry about understanding this since these folks will not be eligible under um, the homeless prevention project. So you're really for at risk. You're focusing on that slide previously um, that we covered with they have to be under a certain amount of income, can't have those resources, and also have to meet one of those eligible conditions. Next slide, Kim. I'm going to pass it back to Gordon. All right, ESG eligibility by component. I can tell you right now that tiny foam cutouts of people are not eligible for ESG assistance, but let's look at some folks who are. Next slide, please. So this is a great slide. Uh, it's Christmas themed, so it's good year round. Um, if you are interested in bookmarking any part of this presentation, this slide is a good slide um, because this is a crosswalk of uh, eligibility by category and by at risk for each, uh, each of the four participant serving components under ESG. Um, there are you will notice a lot of asterisks because much depends on the circumstance in many cases. Um, but this is a good slide to know what it, I, the yeses are important. Um, but this is a great slide to know where your nos are, um, as I think what the most uh, the most important piece of this one is. Next slide, please. Let's have a look at those asterisks. So, uh, category one for street outreach projects. Category one, people who, uh, uh, people who meet uh, category one must be experiencing unsheltered homelessness, meaning they're living on streets or another place not meant for human habitation, and they have to be unwilling or unable to access services in emergency shelter to qualify for street outreach. That last caveat being because if they can access and have access to emergency shelter, they should be served by emergency shelter instead. Uh, category four, 
Um, this again is what I was talking about before. Uh, category four is not an independent eligibility criterion. Um, category one is the core eligibility criterion for street outreach. Category four is something that you would call you would use to qualify in addition to. And the reason you would do that is because it qualifies you for additional protections under the Violence Against Women Act. In addition to which, if the project happens to be dedicated exclusively to people fleeing domestic violence, it might be a mandatory criterion. That said, I don't know that I've ever seen a street outreach program dedicated to uh, people fleeing domestic violence, but who knows? Next slide, please. For emergency shelter, category one, you are eligible without restriction. I'm going to say this again. Category one, you are eligible without restriction. Anyone who meets the category one definition is eligible for emergency shelter. And moreover, the documentation requirements for Category 1 under emergency shelter and under street outreach are gentler than they are under rapid rehousing. I believe there's a slide talking about this later. It is my favorite part to play. Um, category 4, also eligible without restriction uh, for emergency shelter. Um, trying to decide how much to harp on that one. Um, Eligible without restriction. The thing that I'll say about this is that emergency shelter, it's helpful to think about emergency shelter not as having eligibility criteria, which it does, but it's useful to think about it, unlike the other ESG components, not as having, having eligibility criteria, but as producing documentation of eligibility for other services. Because the barrier to getting into shelter is so low, if you show up and self-certify under either of these categories, and the self-certification barrier is low, um, you should be admitted to shelter if it's available. Uh, and so thinking of emergency shelter as how you qualify for things like rapid rehousing rather than something that you have to, <clears throat> excuse me, only Tuesday and my voice is going. Um, if you think about it as the way that you qualify rather than something that you qualify for, you'll have a better grip on the way low barrier shelter works. Next slide, please. Thank goodness. Back over to you, Erin. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Gordon. Um, so for ESG rapid rehousing projects that are funded by California HCD, <clears throat> you can serve clients that are meeting the category one definition as well as clients that are meeting the category four definition. However, as Gordon mentioned earlier, um, you have to make sure that clients that meet that category four definition also meet the criteria for category one. So again, if you have um, a participant that is experiencing or fleeing domestic violence, dating violence, stalking, assault, um, you can serve them as long as they also meet that category one eligibility, which means that they are on the street in a shelter or exiting that institution that they stayed in for less than 90 days and were homeless prior uh, to that. Next slide, Kim. Thank you. So for homelessness prevention ESG projects funded by California HCD, these projects can serve people who meet the category two definition or the category four definition, as well as the at-risk definition that I covered for individuals and families. And note that for each of these eligibility categories, participants have to have an income at or below 30% of the area median income. And for the at-risk of homeless definition, they have to also meet one of those additional criteria that I discussed previously. Next slide, Ken. So to wrap up this section on ESG eligibility by component, we are going to cover some of the eligibility waivers that apply specifically for the ESG CV grant. The ESG CV grant funds were made available through the CARES Act during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. So starting with the first one, for the category one homeless definition, an individual can qualify as homeless when exiting an institution where they resided for 120 days or less rather than the usual 90 days that Gordon has already covered. All other aspects of the category one definition still apply. So the main difference with this one is that um, instead of 90 days staying in an institution, they can stay for up to 120 days and still qualify. <clears throat> Next for the homelessness prevention eligibility, the ESG CV waivers did provide an alternative income eligibility requirement for ESG CV homeless prevention. 
However, the California HCD ESG policy limits participation to households at or below 30% AMI. So just keep that little caveat in mind, even though that was part of the waiver, um, California HCD's policy still states that participation, um, that participants have to be at or below 30% AMI, which aligns with the ESG program interim rule. So please remember, you can only serve HP clients if they are at or below 30% AMI. For this next one, regarding the reevaluation of income for prevention and rapid rehousing participants, the income limit for annual evaluation in rapid rehousing and reevaluation for homeless prevention is 50% AMI instead of the 30% AMI requirement for ESG. And I know this sounds confusing because I just said that HP participants can have to be at 30% AMI to be eligible for projects. However, once they are enrolled in the HP project, they can have income increases up to 50% AMI when you're conducting that reevaluation and therefore can continue to receive ESG HP assistance as long as they stay under that 50% AMI. So when they enter, they have to be at 30%. However, they can continue to get ESG if they um, increase their income as long as they stay under that 50% AMI. Moving on to the next row, in the regular ESG program, homeless homelessness prevention participants had to be reevaluated every three months. Under ESG CV, reevaluation for eligibility in homelessness prevention is now um, required no less than every six months, as opposed to the three month requirement with annual ESG. So you do have a little bit more of a buffer window um, to be able to do those reevaluations for homelessness prevention clients. And then lastly, there is a waiver for rapid rehousing eligibility that was outlined in CPD Notice 21-05, and I'm not going to get into this in too much detail because while that notice um, outlined expanded eligibility, California HCD did not amend their plan to include the expanded eligibility, and as such, this waiver is not applicable for California HCD ESG CB funded projects. So we can skip over that one pretty quickly. Next slide, Kim. I'm going to hand it back to Gordon. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, again, you know, I would highlight if you're stacking gold coins, you're probably blown the income evaluation threshold anyway, and you can skip these slides. But assuming you don't have participants who are stacking gold coins, let's have a look at the next slide. So uh, income eligibility evaluation. Here is when you are re uh, here is when you are assessing income eligibility, right? One at intake for homelessness prevention. Two, not less than every three months for annual ESG or every six months for ESG CV for homelessness prevention or for rapid rehousing three, not less than every year. You will notice the thing that is missing here is income evaluation at intake for rapid rehousing. That's missing because it doesn't exist. You don't have to do it. You have to do it at intake and at least every year, or at least every three months or six months thereafter for homelessness prevention, and at least every year thereafter for rapid rehousing, but not at intake for rapid. Next slide, please. Uh, I see that there are questions stacking up in the chat. That's great. We will get them during uh, the Q&A, but they are acute. Thank you for asking them. Um, for rapid rehousing, like I said, income evaluation, not required at intake. This is one of those uh, differences between most COC program projects and ESG. Uh, it's, it's simply not required for ESG. And so if you're running both, this is one of the things to keep in mind that is different. Um, once a person is enrolled, you have to be, uh, income has to be evaluated uh, not less than annually if the household is in the project for over a year, um, and that's conducted. Uh, that evaluation point is that evaluation point is twelve months after one year after enrollment. Uh, it's not at federal fiscal year. It's not at the agency's fiscal year. It's not at the project grant year. So like when the project rolls over, it's not like you have to reevaluate everybody on that day. Um, and it's not like everybody gets a partial first year. Um, it's 12 months from their enrollment in the project. Um, at annual evaluation, 
for rapid, uh, household income has to be below 30% AMI to be, continue being eligible to receive assistance um, from uh, annual ESG funded projects. Um, when we say annual ESG, of course, we mean um, projects funded by annual ESG, but we're talking about both rapid and e uh, rapid and homelessness prevention. This is one of those areas where they have the overlap because the requirement applies to rental assistance, which is a shared activity. Um, at annual evaluation, income has to be below 50% AMI for ESG funded projects. So that again is rapid or homelessness prevention for ESG. Um, for homelessness prevention, you have to evaluate income at intake. You have to uh, reevaluate income uh, no less than once every three months or for ESGCV six months. And at intake and at each reevaluation, income must continue to be below 30% AMI to continue receiving assistance. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. There we go. Uh, so the definition of annual income. Annual income is defined, this is another good one to bookmark, by the way, at 24 CFR 5.609 uh, and 5.611. Um, it defines annual income, and it defines what is and what is not annual income, um, either monetary or not, what needs to be and included and what must be excluded from income calculations. Um, it's, it's, in, it's, it's amounts that whether they're, mo whether they're monetary or not, meaning like whether cash is actually changing hands or not, um, that go to, or on behalf of the family head or spouse, even if they're temporarily absent due, for example, to uh, prison, jail, other institutional reasons, if they're overseas for some reason, et cetera, um, or to any family member. So any household member or they are anticipated to be received from a source outside the family during the 12 month period following project admission or reevaluation. And which are not specifically excluded. We're going to talk about more about that in a minute. Um, that's the 6, 5.611. Uh, final note annual income also means amounts that are derived during the 12 month period from assets to which any member of the family has access. Again, the extreme version of that is you may have an income of zero, but if you have a million dollars in the stock market and you're like realizing dividends from that, that's still income. You don't qualify for this project. I'm sorry, you have a giant stock portfolio. I would also like one. Next slide, please. I would also like one, Gordon. Cool, well, you can, how about this? You can have this next slide instead. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> So now that Gordon has talked to us about income evaluations and definitions, I'm going to go through some examples on types of income that is included and will also cover excluded um, from income evaluations. So first, we're going to start with inclusions. Um, this first box pertains to employment income. So any income included would be the gross amount of pay that they get from their wages, salary, overtime, commission, fees, tips, bonuses, and other uh, forms of compensation. Next would be any net income that they get from operating their own business. Um, and I've had a lot of clients that have been creative in the past, um, you know, as far as operating their own business. So um, that could be kind of a loose term, but, you know, there are definitely uh, multiple ways you can get income through your own self-employment. Also included would be any interest, dividends, and other net income that the participant receives from any kind of real or personal property. Also included are certain benefits, such as the full amount of periodic payments that they get from Social Security, annuities, insurance, retirement funds, pensions, disability, or death benefits. You also have to include a client's payments that they would get in place of their wage earnings. So that would be unemployment compensation, disability compensation, workers' comp, and severance pay. Also included is welfare assistance payments from the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families Program, otherwise known as TANF, as well as any periodic payments that they get for child support and alimony. And lastly, you must include income from military pay, special pay, and allowances. 
So this is a broad overview of the income inclusions. And now we can uh, go to the next slide, Kim, where I'll talk about what is excluded. All right, we have actually more exclusions than inclusions, which is kind of a good thing, I think. Um, <clears throat> so let's review some forms of income that are excluded when you're doing your income evaluations. If you are not familiar with some of these, uh, please know that you are not alone because there were a couple that I learned uh, that were new through this presentation. So we are all learning as we go. Um, so first, any exclusions would be any employment income for children under 18. So for example, if there is a high school age student in the household under age 18 and they have a part-time job, their income would not be calculated towards the overall household income. Also excluded is payments that a household receives for the care of foster children or foster adults. You would also exclude any lump sum payments such as inheritances, insurance payments, capital gains, and settlements for personal property losses. Also excluded are amounts that are specifically for or in reimbursement of the cost of medical expenses, as well as the income of a live-in aid. And to find the definition of what a live-in aid is, you can refer to 24 CFR 5.403. And the easiest way to find those is to just copy 24 CFR 5.403 into your internet search browser. And the first result that pops up should be the link to that CFR. You also have to exclude any income that's received through student financial assistance that's paid directly to the student or to the educational institution. Special military pay for exposure to hostile fire is also excluded, as well as any temporary non-recurring sporadic income such as gifts. And lastly, you cannot include any income received from reparation payments paid by a foreign government for persecution during the Nazi era. This last one I was not familiar with prior to today, and I was not planning on using this term in my vocabulary today, but here we are. Uh, so let's go on to the next slide. We have some more exclusions. Thanks, Kim. Um, so additionally, you also have to exclude income that comes from earnings in excess of $480 for each full-time student that is aged 18 years or older in the household, excluding, <laughs> another exclude, the head of household or spouse. Um, so in this scenario, you would not count any income that is coming in this way uh, for a full-time student, unless they are the head of household or their spouse. You also must exclude adoption assistance payments that are in excess of $480 per adopted child, as well as any deferred periodic amounts from, so from SSI and Social Security or VA disability benefits and periodic is that key word there. Also excluded are amounts that are received by the family in the form of refunds or rebates under state or local law for property taxes that are paid on the unit they dwell in. You also cannot include any amounts paid by a state agency to offset costs for care for a member with a developmental disability that lives at home. And lastly, you must exclude any amounts that are not specifically or that are specifically excluded by any other federal statute, as well as other uncommon items that you can find listed in 24 CFR 5.609 C8. And again, the easiest way to find that list will be to just copy that CFR reg into your internet search browser and the link should be your first search result. I'm gonna hand it back over to Gordon. All right, I'll take it on the next slide. Other federal requirements. Uh, oh, this is, of course, the White House, though. It's usually Congress that's in charge of this particular thing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, determining the amounts of assistance needed to regain stability in permanent housing include rental assistance and financial assistance uh, is the subject of this section. Next slide, please. Um, types of assistance, uh, determination of the types of assistance to be provided in pursuit of housing stability, including rental assistance, financial assistance, and supportive services. Again, we're talking about figuring out what folks need to achieve safe, stable, permanent housing. Next slide, please. Um, one note, oh, so back over to you, Aaron. I apologize. Almost took your coordinated entry thumb. 
That's okay. All right, so the next federal requirement we're going to talk about is coordinated entry, otherwise commonly referred to as CES. You might hear that acronym, the Coordinated Entry System. Probably should have put that on the first slide. Um, there is a lot of information available regarding coordinated entry systems, so I'm not going to touch too much on this today, but I did want to offer up that if you visit our ESG CV training website, which I can drop that link in the chat in a little bit, um, you can find past recordings that we've done on coordinated entry system assessments. We've also had a coordinated entry system FAQ session that were both held in March of last year. So those would give you some good information about coordinated entry. Um, but as a reminder, how coordinated entry relates to our ESG training today. So all of HCD's ESG and ESG CV grantees have to participate in their local coordinated entry system. Each local CES has developed their own evaluation and assessment process. Um, so you want to make sure that you are familiar with what that looks like in your own continuum of care um, and your ESG or ESG CV project has to conduct evaluations that are in accordance with your local CES requirements. Next slide. Another federal requirement that we have is around written standards. So this is another topic that we've also provided training on in the past. Um, so I do recommend that you visit our past trainings website. We've done a couple spotlight series on written standards uh, in November of 2022 and February of 23. And as a reminder, all ESG and ESG CV projects must establish written standards for providing ESG assistance. One requirement for those written standards includes having procedures for evaluating participant eligibility for their assistance under ESG. And if eligibility evaluations have to be conducted in accordance with the local written standards for ESG, as well as all the policies that are established by California HCD, which you can find all of California HCD's policies on their ESG website. Next slide. All right, we are almost to lightning round. So before we move on to our lightning round uh, section of questions, we wanted to highlight a new resource that you might find helpful. Uh, these are client file checklists. So to ensure that all of the documentation that you need for an ESG client file is there, uh, California HCD and ICF have worked together to create checklists that uh, the ESG and ESG CV subrecipients can use for each participant's files. There's a checklist for each type of project. So if you go to that link, you're gonna find checklists for street outreach, emergency shelter, rapid rehousing, and homelessness prevention project types. The most current version of those checklists is on HCD's website. Um, so I definitely encourage you to check those out. And now we're gonna move on to our lightning round. This is very exciting. So this is our first uh, Slido use during uh, during a new and non-traditional presentation. Uh, so if you could move to the next slide, please. And the slide after that, though we do appreciate the uh, good old lightning round graphic. Um, if you could please join us at slido.com. Uh, the code to slido.com that you're going to want to enter uh, on at the top of the screen in that little bubble that's highlighted right there uh, is 2951366. It's 2951366. I believe Chris is going to drop a direct link to that uh, into the chat. Um, but if you could please take a moment and hustle on over to Slido to join us at 2951366, either using the link that Chris just dropped or the number on the screen. Um, I think we can go ahead and take the slides down. Very good. And then I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen in so you can all have the joy of Slido at your fingertips. So I'm gonna go ahead and kind of pop us in here. Um, we're gonna wait for folks to start filtering in. Um, as folks pop over, uh, your names are going to pop up. Uh, we're going to look for a critical mass here. I think we've got uh, around 40 people in, in the session. We've got 15 in the Slido. Hoping we can do a little better than that. Welcome. Pamela, Marsha, Tuesday, John, Kimberly, Amanda, Melinda, Carolyn, Jay, Holly, Rachel, or Rachel, 
Aaron, Melissa, Kristen, Rosario, Shirley, Sawyer, Trisha, Anna, Chelsea. Apologize if I'm missing anybody. We're at around 21. Can we get it a little higher? I'd love to have an even 25. It's going to be fun. There's quizzes. There will be banter. It's 22. Thank you, Melinda. I think that's who we got. Megan. Couple more people. I don't know if you're going to get that last lucky three. I want that last lucky three. 20 people have gone to lunch is what's happened here. 20 people have decided that it was definitely lunchtime around category three. I think that was, that was where we lost them. Okay, well, we'll start with who we've got. And uh, if you tune in a little while later, we'll be happy to have you. Um, so this is just a quick, uh, this is a quiz like other lightning round quizzes. Um, we don't know who is answering what, uh, so please don't, oh, that's 23. Thank you very much, Eleanor, I think. Um, so uh, we don't know who's answering what, so go ahead and take guesses and take a stab at things. Uh, if you don't know, that's okay. This is your opportunity to test your knowledge. That's 24. Thank you, Taylor, I think. 25, did it, back from lunch. Very proud of whomever that was. I think it was Lauren. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. We've got 10 questions and we're excited to dig in. Um, let's go ahead and start the quiz. So no time limit on it. We'll just cut it when we've, given, when we, when we've had a little banter and take about a minute. Um, so which of the following is the most accurate regarding ESG's at-risk of homelessness definition? And Aaron, we'll just kick these back and forth. Um, one by one, because there's no conveniently colored triangles on these. Um, which of the following is the most accurate regarding ESG's at-risk of homelessness definition? Is it that it's interchangeable with the Category 2 definition, that it's different from Category 2 and has its own qualifying criteria, that it can only be used under homelessness prevention and emergency shelter, or that it has no income limitations? What do you think? We've got 11 answers in. 11 is pretty good. Can we get can we get all the way up to 20? Can we go? 14, 17? I have faith in you all. The power of your hearts is strong. <laughs> I said that to get that face out of Aaron. It was absolutely precision targeted. All right, it's 20 folks. Let's see how y'all did. Let's see how y'all did. Um, stop stop or just stop <laughs> oh no no uh show me answers okay uh the uh majority of you thought that it is different from category two and has its own qualifying criteria you are of course correct very good um the at-risk definition and the imminently at-risk definition or the category two definition are are different they have different criteria the fact that they are named similarly and both used for homelessness prevention does not mean they're the same thing. They're different and they're different in important ways. Good job, all of y'all. Next up, Erin. All right, our next question is, which of the following is the most accurate regarding category two homelessness under California HCD's ESG and ESGCB projects? First answer, California HCD's ESG and ESGCB projects cannot serve households under category three. Category three households can only be served with homelessness prevention and emergency shelter. California HCD's ESG and ESG CV projects can serve a limited subsection of households under category three. Or California HCD's ESG and ESG CV projects can serve households who qualify under any subsection of category three. And it seems we have an inaccuracy in our question, which would really be relating to category three. <laughs> yes that's correct tuesday typo thank you for pointing that out good catch chris i suppose they would all be very inaccurate in relation to category two as i reviewed as i review the answers there's no none of the above <laughs> yeah a disciplined refusal to answer All right, Aaron, call it when you're ready. I'm ready. Okay, let's see. What do y'all think? Yay. 
people listened. <laughs> uh, so it looks like the majority of you all said California HCDs, ESG, and ESGCB projects cannot serve households under Category 3, which is correct. Absolutely. Glad to see it. I, I, I was hoping our strong emphasis on please ignore this and never never speak of this again uh, would, would have the desired impact. Um, next up, which of the following is the most accurate regarding eligibility under ESG street outreach? Uh, that, that street outreach can be used as a creative solution to provide additional supportive services for households enrolled in homelessness prevention and rapid rehousing projects. That street outreach projects are required to verify that households lack housing options and support networks as a condition of enrollment, that they can only serve households under the category one definition, or that they can only serve households experiencing unsheltered homelessness. Which of these is the most true? It's the truest, the most accurate. Which of these is right regarding eligibility under ESG funded street outreach? I think this is the trickiest one that we've had yet. Certainly of the three, though they are trickier to come. I had to question which answer I was going to provide. So we, we, mm, all right, all right. Me too, because I could argue a couple of these in a couple different ways. But, uh. I, I, I had that thought when I was writing this. So uh, Mr. Michael Thomas, who is not here today, prepared these questions. And so this was one that I stopped on and had to read a couple of times just to make sure that I was uh, getting them transcribed into Slido uh, correctly. Um, the spirit of Mike Thomas being here, creating tricky questions, even in his absence. It's just one more answer. Come on. Yes. Uh, Tuesday, absolutely correct. All right. Let's have a look. All right. Yeah, just, just, just about half of you were correct that ESG East Street Outreach can only serve uh, households experiencing unsheltered homelessness. Um, it does seem like uh, can only serve households under the category one definition is correct. Um, technically, yes, but that the way that it's, that's that's worded in a way to make it tricky. The core the core eligibility criterion is category one, but category four is also uh, part of their its its service pattern. Um, and uh, ESG street outreach projects are not required to verify that households lack housing options and support networks as a condition of enrollment. Um, like uh, emergency shelter, street outreach uh, has a much lower barrier of verification. So there you go. There you have it. Oh, and um, the top one, uh, sneaky, 4% of you. Um, it, it's, it seems like the right answer because we use the word cre words creative solution. It is a creative solution in that it's not eligible. Um, which I suppose makes it creative. Um, but no, if someone is enrolled in homelessness prevention or rapid rehousing, they do not meet the basic criteria for street outreach, which is that they're experiencing unsheltered homelessness. People who are uh, enrolled in homelessness prevention are housed, and people who are enrolled in rapid rehousing are receiving rapid rehousing services and are lightly housed. It's just the way it works. For a quick thing about that. So when you're reading these answers, where it says ESSO, you're not saying emergency shelter and street outreach, right? Yes, okay. ESG street outreach. ESG okay. street outreach. I think that's also where I got thrown off on that third answer because emergency shelter, ES, can serve, you know, category one people. So a perfectly good point. Well raised and well made. Appreciate it. For those of you who got this wrong because you were thrown by that, I apologize. I will give you your gold star back. Just uh, send like a prepaid envelope. I'll give you Chris's address um, and he can return it to you in six to eight business weeks. Hmm. I'm um, going to explain my wrong answer because yeah, it's it. going to be a right answer, which is <clears throat> street outreach can actually serve people that are sheltered uh, yes, under can. very certain circumstances, but that's only an AAQ answer. It's not yet in the interim or final rule. Uh, it, it does show up in the ESG HMIS manual slightly. <clears throat> So we are working on uh, a way for street outreach to continue continuity of services for those that would become unsheltered again, lest that street outreach connection, which kind of gets to that creative solution of providing services. But it's really more about having people not slide backwards just because a street outreach worker created such a strong um, um, uh, you know, relationship. We don't want that to be a barrier. 
but the regulation says you cannot provide uh, street outreach services in the facility, which has been interpreted as basically any building, so you have to do it outside. Um, so we are kind of wiggling with that, which is why I could make a case for number three instead of number four, but um, there's nothing wrong um, with the answer. It's just I kind of know some of the policy shifts happening. And I appreciate that. I wanted to bring that up and it completely flew out of my head because I think it's I think it's so cool, right? It's an important flexibility that ensures people aren't just bouncing from the process isn't getting in the way of serving people, which I like to see. I love to see it. All right. Uh, question four, Aaron, all you. All right. Oh, so we are moving on to it looks like category four question. So in relation to a household that requests services in relation to domestic violence, otherwise known as DV, which of the following is the most accurate? One, households fleeing DV should always be referred to a DV specific emergency shelter if possible. Two, households fleeing DV must also qualify under category one to access ESG funded emergency shelter. Three, Households fleeing DV must also qualify under category one to access ESG funded rapid rehousing. So don't get hung up on options two and three because I already did in my head. <laughs> and then lastly, households fleeing DV must follow HUD's order of documentation priority, beginning with third party certification and caseworker observation before moving into that self certification in order to qualify for ESG. This is also tricky. This is also tricky. And since Mike's not here, we can just blame him, right? He just came up with these tricky questions. Well, he did actually come up with all of them. So even if he was here, I would blame him to his face. <laughs> <laughs> and he would be like, yes, I did. I did. This, this was especially... For 10 questions, he would say the whole time, yeah, this one's especially tricky. I thought this one was especially villainous. And I would just be like, yep, you're right. It was. Love it. Yep. All right. I think I'm ready to see what people came up with. All right. Let's have a look. All right. Yeah. So looks like most people got the uh, answer correct. So it is households fleeing DV must also qualify under category one to access ESG funded rapid rehousing, which is that keyword there, rapid rehousing. So I have a question for you, Erin. Um, the first answer here looks like a pretty good answer to me if I'm a service provider. Um, households fleeing DV should always be referred to a DV specific emergency shelter if possible. Why is that not the best answer? If I was a caseworker, I would say, because if I am have an ESG program in the moment, I am interacting with this client, they are in need of my services, I want to go ahead and serve them. Referring to a DV specific emergency shelter would probably be one of the tools in the toolbox that I would use as a case manager. Um, but if someone is presenting to me for services, I don't want to just turn them away to another resource right away. Um, and I don't know about your all's communities, but uh, in mine, we don't have a DV specific emergency shelter. So if there was, sure, we'd love to refer them to that. Um, but also, I think that would, you know, be kind of a secondary thing as far as you're trying to address the needs that they are presenting in front of you in that moment. Spot on perfect answer. Thank you for that. I appreciate you taking the, the sideball over there. Um, the only thing that I would add to that additionally is there's a participant choice component. Some participants who would qualify for a DV specific shelter don't want to go to a DV specific shelter because it feel, it, it, they're not in a position where that feels emotionally right to them. So there's a participant choice thing on top of it all. Um, awesome answer. Awesome question. Awesome job, everybody. Let's have a look at what's next. So which of the following is not something that a new case manager working in an ESG funded homelessness prevention project would find in their project policies and procedures regarding eligibility? Which of the following is not something that would be found in a homelessness prevention project policies and procedures? That A, all households must have income below 30% AMI to qualify. That B, uh, homelessness prevention assistance may be provided to households that meet HUD's at-risk definition. That C, 
ESG HP assistance may be provided to households that meet the category two definition as long as their outcome income outcome is below 30% AMI or D. Is it that homelessness prevention assistance may be provided to households that meet the category three definition as long as their income is below 30% AMI? Which of the following is not something you would find in a homelessness prevention project policies and procedures, at least not one that we've approved? Maybe it's out there somewhere in like a bootleg HP manual. It's like under, it's underground. It's pretty indie. You, you probably haven't heard of it. <laughs> now I said that to get that face out of Chris and it worked. <laughs> I will say that this is tricky too because there were multiple times that we told them, ignore this, don't pay attention, we're skipping. So yep. you would yep. have had to have listened to what we told you to ignore. Yep, it's a little tricky. It is a little tricky. All right, well, that's a uh, critical mass. Let's have a look here. Oh, I knew I, I my faith was well placed in y'all. Uh, the answer is, of course, uh, that you would not find ESG HP assistance being provided to households that meet the category three definition for any reason at all, because you can't serve people in category three. Good job to you all. Very proud, extremely proud. Well done. Erin, over to you. Mm -hmm. All right. So a household is currently residing in a COC program funded rapid rehousing project that is operated by another agency that applies for ESG CV funded rapid rehousing. Which of the following is true about this household's ESG CV rapid rehousing eligibility? First answer, the household can qualify for ESG CV rapid rehousing if their income is below 30% AMI. Second option, the household can qualify for ESG CV rapid rehousing based on rapid rehousing eligibility waivers that are available to ESG CV funded agencies. Three, the household cannot qualify for ESG CV rapid rehousing because this specific waiver is not included in California HCD's consolidated plan. And lastly, the household should be immediately referred to an emergency shelter. And we're looking for the best answer out of all of these. See, and I thought this is the tricky one. This is the one that pulled me up that I was like, mm, do I need to look this one up? Because I'm not sure. So I'm, I'm interested in the, the answers we get here. There's two answers that I would pick in this list. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I think if nothing else, these lightning rounds always highlight that some questions are so easy that everybody knows them. And then every other question is tricky enough that even the TA providers are like, well, it's a little tricky actually, which I just, I think it highlights that this is a complex program and it's okay to be uh, in a perpetual learning stance. Oh, wait, just another minute since only about half have responded. <clears throat> Is like my nicest possible spin to put on ESG is like slightly overregulated. <laughs> Permission for a permanent learning stance. All right, let's go ahead and see what people. All right. Mm. All right, yes. Interesting though, no one picked the other option that I thought was a potentially a viable option. But yes, uh, I think we all, the majority of us got right. The household cannot qualify for ESG CV rapid rehousing because this was one of the things that I told you to ignore um, because this waiver for expanded rapid rehousing eligibility is not part of HCD's con plan. Very good. All right, let's have a look at what's up next. Which of the following is true regarding income eligibility for ESG rapid rehousing? That income must be evaluated not less than annually after intake. That it must be, must be, not most be, must be evaluated at intake and not less than annually thereafter. That it must be evaluated at intake and not less than annually thereafter. Are those two the same? Why would, no, they're, one is most and one is must. Um, and uh, in, finally, income is subject to special waivers for rapid rehousing under ESG CV. I'll be interested to know if there's a difference between the uh, number of people who answer two and three based on must and most. If 
I think this one was probably my fault. I think there was probably a third answer in there that I just zoomed past. And I actually, after we talk about the answer, Gordon, I do have a follow-up question to this, if you don't mind. Oh, yeah, no. You have to ask. You can throw it straight in my head. Sorry. Adds a little spice to the new and non-traditional when I have questions fired directly at my field of vision. Mm -hmm. 19 answers, folks are getting them in. Okay, let's have a look at what y'all think. Huh? All right. Uh, thank you to the 5% of you who uh, decided income most be evaluated. I deeply appreciate that commitment to the bid. Um, let's have a look at what the answer was. And this is contentious. Uh, the correct answer is that income must be evaluated not less than annually after intake. So this is the tricky thing, uh, and we highlighted this, but we highlighted it because it is tricky. Um, for ESG rapid rehousing, you do not have to evaluate income at intake. You have to evaluate it at least annually thereafter, which realistically means annually thereafter, um, but you don't have to evaluate it at intake. And that's different from homelessness prevention, which must be evaluated at intake and periodically thereafter, depending on whether it's annual or uh, ESGCB. Um, so it's it's tricky. It is it is a little bit tricky to keep those things different uh, in your head. Uh, Aaron Rutherford, fire away. Yes. So I'm actually glad that I think this uh, demonstrates my follow up question. So. One thing that we have seen through monitoring is that some communities written standards state that they require an income evaluation at the time of intake. So if the community has adopted more stringent standards, is that allowable? So Slido has like a live Q&A function that I desperately wish I had thought to set up because I would love to poll the group to see what they think. Um, and not just put it in the chat and put somebody on the spot. Um, so I will go ahead and just fork it out there. Um, you can absolutely adopt more stringent standards um, in the subrecipients' written policies or in the project policies and procedures. Your standards can always be more stringent than the standards above. They just can't be looser than the standards above. And so you can absolutely do income evaluation at intake that said, it's not a best practice because fundamentally those th those income those income threshold the, the 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 income tests are really a legacy of these programs outgrowth from public housing in Section Eight, which is means tested, and they're means tested. First of all, I don't like means testing to begin with, but they're means tested for at least kind of a, co a, a coherent reason, which is that they are low income housing programs. In theory, what you're looking for is to make sure that a household is low income. ESG is not a low income housing program. It is a homeless services program. And homelessness isn't just about income. It's about like all the many circumstances that contribute to a person being housing unstable. A person could and I've seen this happen, it's not common, but it does happen. A person could be over that income threshold and still absolutely not be in a position to be permanently housed um, or not be able to achieve permanent housing without uh, subsidy and assistance through rapid rehousing. So, um, you know, you can, it's not disallowable. Um, it's not like we're gonna punish you. It's not disallowed in the ESG written standards. It's not, it's not, uh, disallowed in HCDs written standards, um, but it's really not a good practice because it's it's not good for participants. It's also just like it's more work. Why why would you do why would you do that? Why would you do that to yourself? So that's my kind of comprehensive. Here's why and here's why not and please don't answer. Does that does that get at it, Aaron? Yep, that helps. Right. Thank you. Thank you for the question. It was a great question. Over to you for question eight. All right. Okay. So let's see if you are paying attention to that really lengthy slide that I went over. Okay. So which of the following is not included when calculating household income? So this would be an exclusion. Uh, gross wages, salaries, tips, and bonuses. Income for children under the age of 18. Regular military pay or TANF payments or the temporary assistance to needy family payments. 
this which one slide is wicked. not included. Yeah, this slide is wicked. I got to tell you, back in my misty case management days when dinosaurs ruled the earth, uh, I had a printout of two, C uh, of, or sorry, of um, five six oh nine and five six eleven. My desk. This was when printouts were a thing, um, because like this, this is complicated. This is not intuitive. So I'm curious how folks come out. We got a good group response. I think. Let's see what they said. No. Yeah. Woohoo! Y'all got it! Eighty-six percent of you were extraordinarily successful at uh, listening to a complicated slide by Erin Rutherford in what I believe is her debut new and non-traditional presentation. Am I correct about that? Yes. A strong piece of teaching, I think. Well, to be eighty-six uh, percent successful. For the nine percent of TANF and the five percent of Bruce Wade, like. That was very complicated, trying to understand what income is included versus excluded, even though I was reading it. I could not confidently tell you the difference between all of them, um, per se. So just want to say, you know, don't worry about that if you didn't get that right, because it is complex. And, um, you know, I think going back and reading those CFRs that we mentioned would hopefully be a little helpful. For sure. All right. Question nine, when evaluating the assistance needed by a newly enrolled rapid rehousing household, which of the following should potentially be considered in terms of the service to deliver to them? Is it A, rental assistance, B, financial assistance, C, supportive services, or D, all of the above? Which of these should be considered for a newly enrolled rapid rehousing household? We did kind of blow through this slide a little bit. It's not really what we're talking about today, uh, kind of head on, but it is important. I'll be excited to see right answers here. That well, looks like a critical mass to me. 100% correct. Of course, you are all right. You should consider all of these. They might not all be right. Not every household needs them, but you should think about all of them. They're all tools in your toolbox. Good job, everybody. Over to you, Aaron, to close us out. One. All right. A newly created ESG rapid rehousing project is not sure what is the best way to receive referrals. Which is the best way for the project to proceed in making that determination? First, should they consult with the local COC to determine how to receive referrals from the local coordinated entry system? Should they consult with California HCD to determine the most compliant referral method based on California EA, California HCD's ESG written standards? Should they work directly with local street outreach teams to identify the best possible referrals for the project? Or should they draw referrals directly from the organization's emergency shelter if they are a great match for the project? And again, you are going with the best way that you should proceed. This is the real cruel question, in my opinion. Because that wrong answer that I'm looking at is it's just so tempting. It's so, it's so tempting. It is the forbidden fruit. <laughs> All right, let's see if anyone selected the forbidden fruit. Bit? Anyone bit for the forbidden fruit? I, it's just, it was right there. It itself was the low hanging fruit. All right. Y'all did great. So yes, you should consult with your local continuum of care to determine how to receive referrals from the local coordinated entry system. So just a reminder, we said that all ESG projects have to participate in their local CES and every COC probably has a slightly different C uh, CES and how it works and operates. So you want to consult with them to figure out the best way to get referrals. I know as a former provider, it is very easy to uh, choose those last two options, um, but the best answer is to go through the coordinated entry system. I'm gonna leave that there for the day. Uh, you said it perfect and I'm not gonna pile on. All right, that brings us to the end of the Slido portion of the Slido. 
I'm going to go ahead and uh, take that screen share down. Everybody did great. Thank you for participating in the inaugural launch of our new non-traditional Slido portion. We're now segueing into Q&A. Um, and I am not sure, is Kim moderating our Q&A today or are we self-moderating? I think we're self-moderating. I can read them out to you, Gordon, if that helps. Oh, oh, oh that was very that was very slick. Uh, I, they can be read to me if that helps. Um, yeah, sure, fire away. Though I'm going to kick some back to you because I think you are equally equipped uh, to answer most of these. It's about income, probably not. Um, well, I'll take the first one because I think you already answered this. So Rachel had asked, and I, I she might have gotten the answer, but just to reiterate, um, for re-evaluations for rapid rehousing, are you doing those evaluations every year on the date of enrollment? or yearly when you start a new fiscal year. So the answer to that was um, at the time of annual enrollment. So if the client enrolls July 15th, 2023, their uh, re-eval will be July 15th, 2024. Um, you are not going by the fiscal year. All right, Gordon, I'm gonna pass the next one to you. What all is needed to be reviewed for a re-evaluation? is needed to be reviewed for a re-evaluation. So I'm assuming that this question is uh, slightly beyond income, that this is about what is what is actually required at annual re-evaluation. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to kind of restrict it to what we're talking about here. So you have to recertify the participant's income as part of annual recertification. Um, so you have to certify that they uh, for rapid rehousing, that they are below the uh, income threshold for homelessness prevention, that they're below the income threshold. Um, you'll notice that there wasn't a recertification process for emergency shelter or street outreach. It's because there isn't one. Um, you do not need to recertify for shelter or street outreach. Um, once you're in, you're, you're in. Uh, the, and you will also notice that there was no point at which in here or, or really anywhere else that we talked about recertifying that a person is still experiencing homelessness. It's because once you certify that you are experiencing homelessness in accordance with an eligible uh, category um, at project intake, you're good to go for as long as you remain enrolled in that project. Now, if you were to exit that project and then try to re-enroll in that project or another project of that type or another ESG project, you would need to re-qualify as experiencing homelessness under an eligible category under that new project or under that subsequent enrollment in the project. But as long as your project enrollment is continuous, you never need to recertify as experiencing homelessness. Um, the only thing that I would add to that is that projects can add additional recertification criteria to an extent um, as long as they don't get on the wrong side of housing first requirements, which themselves are a little bit complicated here in California. And so what I would say to that is in theory, projects can have additional recertification criteria. In practice, you really should not. Um, and I would encourage you to stay away from adding additional recertification criteria. They add work. They can there's a strong tendency for them to be exclusionary. They don't really help your participants. They don't really make your project better. And you could well end up on the wrong side of your state housing first statutes or what I expect will be your state housing first guidelines soon. Uh, I think that pretty well answers that. Any, Aaron, anything you want to add? No, that was great. Okay. Um, next question from Rachel. And I might have to if you want to elaborate, Rachel, to come off mute, but you were asking if the waiver applies to yearly reevaluation for California rapid rehousing. I'm guessing you were referring to the slide where we were talking about the eligibility waivers. Um, and on that slide where we talked about uh, the reevaluation for rapid rehousing, um, that was in regards to the income limit for annual reevaluation. So just as a reminder, that is 50% AMI. Um, does that help answer your question, Rachel, or was there something else you were? Rachel had to leave halfway through, so she'll be reviewing your answer uh, in recording. Oh, I still see her. Okay, um, maybe she gave her a link to someone else. All right, um, next one. So we have uh, from Marshy. So for income exclusions, 
It includes income that is non-monetary also. So does that include food assistance through TANF and SNAP? Uh, Gordon, I'm gonna take a first stab at this. If they are getting uh, food assistance through SNAP, that would not be an income inclusion because you are only able to use that money specifically for food. Um, you can't you know, get your SNAP amount uploaded on your EBT card every month and go spend it on whatever you want. You can only spend it on food. Um, so foods, uh, food stamps are now called SNAP would not be included in that. Is that accurate? Yes, uh, and I would uh, actually the only thing I'd add to that you're exactly correct and your re the reasoning is exactly correct. Beyond that it is explicitly cited in 5.611 as an excluded income source so food share food benefits uh, are not considered income um, and have not been since that statute was passed so um, yeah spot on. Um, the next one we have is, would we exclude SSI received for children? My response would be, yes, that would be excluded because it's child income, but because it's SSI, I'm not totally confident, so I need you to confirm that. That is an, that's an interesting question. So I, it received for children makes me think that, it, I, I think I'm getting a little thrown by received for children. So why don't I talk it through a little bit? SSI, SSDI received, SSI, SSDI is received at the family level, right? So it's not like if you've got a household of five people, five letters, show, five checks show up every month, right? Or there's five deposits that are broken out by person. Um, you get one for your household and it's contingent on your household size and composition and there's like 15 other factors. Um, and so you would not exclude the portion of SSI received as a result of there being children in the household. So that's not an exclusion. Um, First, because it would be difficult to untangle what portion is received for children in the household, but second, because the full balance of SSI is an inclusion um, as part of thing, and it is it is received per person, um, but it is fundamentally household tied, uh, and so yeah, so SSI ultimately SSI SSDI is counted for the household, um, and it's it's not um, you you do not receive an exclusion for that. Um, one thing that I will say, though, uh, is when we talk about children and exclusions, there is a statutory exclusion. I think it's $480 per child in the household that is excluded from gross income. Um, the final thing that I would add is that there are situations in which the child receives SSI payments to the child directly. Um, that's not the norm, but it is the reality that that does sometimes happen. Um, in situations where a child is receiving the income directly, so there's not, there's no media, there's no, it's going into the household pool, there's no, it's mediated as full household income. Um, if it is the child's income specifically, then it is statutorily excluded, but that is the exception, not the rule. It's a complicated, it's tricky, it's complicated. Um, the same incidentally applies for SSDI in situations where SSDI would apply. And I believe the same is true also for um, military benefits. Any of the, any situation in which income is scattered around like that, I think that, that, that uh, in situations where the payment is going directly to a child, including when the child is technically the head of household, um, you're in a situation where the income is not, uh, is, is excluded, it's not included. Thanks, Gordon. Yeah, it's so a tricky. We, oh, there was a quick follow-up question to that before I move on to the next one, survivor's benefits. I think, um, I think it's the same situation where if it's a, a payment to the household, then it's um, treated as included. Uh, if it's for, if it's a payment directly to the child, including uh, in situations where you have a head of household under the age of 18, I believe that it is excluded. Um, that said, you know, I, I would encourage you to review the CFR when you're making these determinations. And if you're still getting tangled up or you're not totally sure, I am not a youth homelessness expert. 
and I'm certainly not a, a child homelessness expert. It's not my area of particular expertise. This is a good place where the AAQ is your friend. Um, I know that the answers are in there. I just don't have them at my fingertips right now. And you can expect a quick turnaround. Thanks. And I think we just have one more question. And I might need Pamela to elaborate because I didn't catch like which slide we were on when she asked this. But uh, she asked, how do you know their income is less than 30% to rapid rehousing funds if not taken at intake? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think I need more information to provide a good answer to that question because I'm not sure where the, the hitch is. That actually came up during the lightning round on the question we had about uh, rapid rehousing folks um, only need, not needing to be meet 30% at intake, but at annual reevaluation. I'm pretty sure that's where that came from. That's why I thought I saw it came up. I see Pamela yeah. muted herself. So Pamela, if you have anything you want to add, go ahead. Yeah, hit. Right. Uh, we do rapid rehousing where we pay deposits and possible first month's rent. But in, or it, in all of the poverty tables, we have to meet the 30% or less income, but we're only helping them the one time. We don't, we don't do an annual reassessment on anything. So if we don't qualify their income at 30% at intake, would we not be following the ESG requirements? So and I'm not sure I heard you. So if you could restate, and I apologize for that, where is the requirement for uh, calculating that 30% coming from in your project's operational stream? Is it the, the property is requiring it? No, the, the grant requirements for ESG annual on yeah. our... On our annual grants, they have to be 30% or less income on the poverty table to be able for us to spend our grant monies on that client. And we don't deal with them after we pay the deposits. So there is no later intervention of qualifying at the 30% level other than at the intake. Okay. Um, well, this that's news to me. Um, I would invite Aaron or Tuesday to weigh in. Tuesday, it looks like you're in the chat on this one. If either of the two of you would like to weigh in from a GA perspective or Kim. There's no, I'll say, there's no requirement for a rapid rehousing uh, to meet that income threshold. I'm sorry, repeat that. There's no there's no requirement for um for uh rapid rehousing to meet uh income requirement at intake. It would just be if you're giving assistance greater than a year. I think it true? just kind of sounds like one of those situations where I don't know if it's you know your organization have has decided to set more stringent uh ESG requirements, but um federally according to HUD and according to HCD's policies, um, they do not have to be under 30% AMI uh, in order to get rapid rehousing assistance at the time of intake. So if we don't if we don't have any further contact with the client after they are housed, how does that less than 30% income requirement get met? Uh, so uh, just to lift up what Tuesday and Aaron are saying, that requirement doesn't exist. You do not have to certify for ESG rapid rehousing housing that a participant is at or below 30% income at intake. So I would encourage you to review your grant contract with HCD. If that requirement is in there, then that requires some follow-up um, and we can help facilitate that. Um, but I suspect that it is not in there and that that's maybe a holdover from work that you've done with public housing authorities in the past uh, or with other grants that do have that requirement, but it's not there for rapid rehousing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank and I think you. I'll just, just add upon that for one second, Gordon. So it does sound like it was probably a program choice to build your program that way. And I think, you know, you can be less restrictive. You just can't be more loose. So it may 
be all that you you know that you really want. When you look at our rapid rehousing policy, we're really um, guiding rapid rehousing programs in their policies and procedures to um, size the um, rental assistance, to size the financial assistance based on what the household actually needs, so that everyone gets just gets this. Um, only type of service is really not in line with in where HCD policies are headed. Gordon, I think you're going to build upon that since those are policies you would know well, maybe not. Yeah, no, I, I don't have really anything to add. Chris is exactly correct. We want to steer you away from doing that because at the end of the day, like I said, this is a homeless services program, not a low income household services program. Thanks, Gordon. Yeah, thank you. It was a great question. I'm glad you raised it, and I, I appreciate you pursuing it to dig into why the answer was the way it was. Um, so thank you for that, Pamela. Uh, we have a good question from Melissa. She is ready to grill her colleagues with this quiz. Um, and I know since we switched to Slido, those questions are not part of the PowerPoint slides, but I'm going to go ahead and say yes, when we send the follow-up email, we can include those questions and answers so that you can test your team i'll see i'll see what i can do nothing left if nothing else i can get some screenshots for you that's what that's you know worst comes to worst thanks um okay let me keep scrolling down through the chat because we had some links and then okay next question i see is from amanda um so just to confirm a motel hotel stay being paid by the participants family or friends would not make a participant eligible. The stay would have to be paid by a government program or charitable organization. Uh, Amanda, you are correct. Uh, your understanding is spot on. Um, if they are you know, paying for the hotel themselves or borrowing money from family or friends in order to cover that cost, they would not meet that category one definition. Aaron is exactly correct. The only thing that I would add is just a reiteration of what I said earlier, that I think that rule sucks. It is, and I think many people agree that that rule sucks, but it is unfortunately not something you can get around. A lot of these rules suck, so. <laughs> that out there. Um, I think that's all the questions we had in the chat. If I've missed anything, please feel free to unmute or put it back in the chat. Come on, you don't want to take keep us an extra 17 minutes talking about uh, client eligibility? That's not what you want to do with your Tuesday afternoon? I'm here for um, it. Hi, this is Marche. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, just a follow-up about the rapid rehousing. So if we're not doing, if, if per ESG, we, we don't need to do the income eligibility upon intake. So say if like their intake was today, we provide them assistance next month and they don't get, they're still in our program, but they don't get reevaluated again because we provide a, and say if their income went up and they're no longer at the 30, below 30%, would that make that assistance unbillable or not, um, not allowable per ESG? So I'll go ahead and take that one. So, I think the situation you're asking about is a participant enters the project, their income is question mark. Later, you discover that they are the heir to the Walton Foundation, annual income $44 billion. The question is, retroactively, once you discover that, do, does all of the assistance paid to that household become ineligible for reimbursement? The answer is no, right? Uh, income evaluation is effective as of the time you do income evaluation. And so it doesn't retroactively make someone not eligible just because their income is uh, over the 30% threshold whenever you uh, your project is set up to do that, that calculation. Um, and, you know, joking aside, that's what you want to see, right? Like a participant gets into your project and a year later you discover like, oh man, their income went up. Like what a tragedy. They now have like the income they need to sustain themselves and safe permanent housing. Like actually that's a huge success story that is the result of good project management practices. 
Um, not only does that not make those costs ineligible, that's how it's supposed to work. You're supposed to discover over time that people's income has gone up and they're now able to subsidize their own housing without a public subsidy underneath. Erin, anything you want to add on that? Yeah, I did want to, in the situations where some communities have set more stringent written standards, so if you have, you know, procedures in place that say that you have to do evaluations every 90 days, I've seen that a lot um, through our monitoring, a lot of projects seem to have 90 day re-evals. Um, if you do have that as your policy and at that 90 day eval you find that they are no longer eligible, you would have to exit them because those are the policies or written standards that you have in place. Um, I agree with Gordon. I think trying to be as flexible as possible is a good thing. I, I hate to see, you know, all these clients that are getting exited at the 90 day mark because, you know, they happen to have gotten a job, but just because you got a job doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be really good to go in the next month. Um, sometimes that takes a little long longer for your income to set in or even for you to build it. So um, I think if you have those restrictions right now, I would highly recommend rethinking that. Um, because also one thing we found during monitoring is that a lot of agencies have that procedure, but also are not doing that procedure. And if you have a procedure and you're not doing it, that also you know can show up as a ding um, when you are getting monitored either by California or HUD. So um, make it easier on yourself, require annual evals so you don't have to worry about it every three months. Thank you so much for that explanation. That helps me understand a lot. Thank you. And the only thing I'll, I'll also add sometimes, because, and I don't know if this goes into kind of what Pamela's situation is too, but I have seen some programs that do request uh, proof of income at the time of intake, just so they can determine how much rental assistance they want to provide. So, I mean, if you ask, you know, a client to say, hey, what's your income this month? You know, are you going to be able to pay the full amount of rent or do you need us to cover part? Um, fine, but I just, you know, be careful that you are not requiring that they absolutely have to um, provide that at intake if you don't need to. All right. Last call for questions. Okay. Well, you don't have to go back to work, but you can't keep listening to us. Kim, why don't you wrap us on out? Thanks, Gordon, and thanks, Aaron. Thank you all for attending this California Housing and Community Development Community Workshop session offered through the Emergency Solutions Grant Coronavirus Relief Consulting and Staffing Services Contract. Look out for more information on the next new and non-traditional providers workshop series session. Um, a three-question survey will pop up as the session ends. Um, please make sure that you give us your feedback so we can ensure that the training sessions are um, useful as possible. You all have a great day. Thank you.